Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Rick Dunham, White House correspondent for Business Week magazine and chairman of the board of the National Press Club. Uh, I'd like to welcome our members and the guests in the audience today, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live, and it's available through the National Press Club, the website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons also are carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members also may access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase the transcripts and audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I'd like to remind our members of some upcoming National Press Club luncheons. Monday, June 18th, Terrence Jones, the president and CEO of the Wolf Trap Foundation for the Performing Arts will discuss commissioning new performance in today's politically and economically challenging environment. On Friday, June 22nd, Frank Keating, the governor of Oklahoma, will be our guest at the Press Club. On Monday, June 25th, George Mitchell, the former Senate Majority Leader and the chairman of the Sharm El Sheikh Fact-Finding Commission, which recently issued a report on the current Israeli-Palestinian crisis, will speak on the Middle East. And coming up this summer, we have some uh, big names on the agenda, including Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor for the President, on July 12th, and Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton will be making her debut as a luncheon speaker on July 19th. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided on your tables and pass them up to me. I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce the head table and ask the guests at the head table to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right, John Hurley of the McClendon News Service. Larry Witham covers religion for the Washington Times. Caitlin Hendel the co-leader of the economy team at Bloomberg News and a former colleague of mine at the Dallas Times-Herald. Chris Newcomet of McGraw-Hill. Jan Duplain, the president and CEO of Duplain Enterprises, who represents the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington. Father Drew Christensen, senior fellow at the Woodstock Theological Center and counselor on international affairs at the U.S. Catholic Conference. John Cosgrove, distinguished former president of the National Press Club and a communications consultant. Skipping our speaker for a moment, we have Martin Tolchin, the publisher and editor of The Hill. Melissa Charbonneau, White House correspondent for CBN. Shelvia Dancy, national correspondent for Religion News Service. Frank Smythe, Washington representative of the Committee to, uh, to Protect Journalists. And Mamora Onaki, American Bureau Chief for the Chunichi Tokyo Shimbun. Now, the first time a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church spoke at the National Press Club was 1936. The speaker was Eugene Cardinal Pacelli, Vatican Secretary of State. It so happened that Cardinal Pacelli soon thereafter became the Pope, Pope Pius XII. Now, I'm not saying that today's speaker, <laughs> Theod Theodore Cardinal McCarrick, will be the next pope, but uh, likely he'll be there picking the next pope. In February, just seven weeks after he was installed as Archbishop of Washington, Cardinal McCarrick was named one of 44 cardinals by Pope John Paul II. He's one of 134 cardinals eligible to vote to elect the next pope. I trust he'll benefit from some of the experiences of the last American presidential election, and um, in case he's called upon to um, settle a dispute in the, um, in, in the papal election. After all, the College of Cardinals is um, governed by a different kind of Supreme Court. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, seriously though, uh, Cardinal McCarrick is a leading Catholic voice on um, social justice, human rights, and religious freedom, both in the United States and around the world. As the New York Times wrote in March, quote, trying to improve the world step by halting step is the vocation of this much-traveled cleric who insists that his focus on human rights overseas 
and against workshops, uh, sweatshops and homelessness in the United States are as much a part of his job as saying mass. Cardinal McCarrick, a self-confessed workaholic who is still spry and tireless at age 70, was one of 155 cardinals who met with a pope for four days in, in Rome last month to discuss the future of the Roman Catholic Church. To show how times change, uh, even in the hallowed halls of, of the Vatican, it was reported that a cell phone rang out during the, uh, a silent moment of uh, contemplation on the first day of this. And yes, uh, these things don't only happen in the White House at photo ops. Uh, but reliable sources tell me the phone did not belong to our speaker today. <laughs> As head of one of the nation's most visible and most diverse Catholic communities, Cardinal McCarrick has focused on the spiritual, moral, and material welfare of the approximately half million Catholics in the District of Columbia and surrounding areas. Though a native of New York City, he is uh, no stranger to Washington. After being ordained in 1958, he went on to earn a second master's degree and a PhD at the Catholic University of America. His, assign his first assignment was assistant chaplain of Catholic University and later dean of students and director of development. After serving as president of the Catholic University of Puerto Rico, he returned to New York to serve as associate secretary for education of the archdiocese and then as secretary to Cardinal Cook. He was named Auxiliary Bishop of New York in 1977 with responsibility for Harlem. He crossed the Hudson River in 1986 to become the first ever Bishop of Metuchen in New Jersey when that diocese was established in 1981. Uh, 19, uh, sorry, in 1981. In 1986, he was named Archbishop of Newark, the seventh largest diocese in the country. Uh, the mayor of Newark, Sharp James, uh, recently said that Cardinal McCarrick's commitment to Newark, quote, was a major force in the city's recent revival. Cardinal McCarrick's involvement in international humanitarian efforts began when he was elected by the National Conference of Catholic Bishops to head its Committee on Migration in 1986. In 1992, he was named to head the Committee for Aid to the Church in Central and Eastern Europe, and four years later was elected Chair of the Committee of, on International Policy. Earlier this year, while hosting President and Mrs. Bush at dinner, he lobbied the president. Always a good idea when you have him close by. Uh, about one of his pet causes, the need for more assistance in El Salvador uh, following the devastating earthquake there on January 13th. With more than 100,000 El Salvador or Salvadoran parishioners, he said he felt as if the disaster had affected his own family. Cardinal McCarrick, who speaks five languages fluently, not including New Yorkies and uh, Joycey talk, um, and understands two more, has visited many nations as a member of the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Religious Freedom Abroad and of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Already this year, he's visited El Salvador, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Italy, and the Caribbean. He's undertaken a number of sensitive political missions for the church, including a January 1998 visit to China to discuss relig religious freedom in that country and a landmark 1988 meeting with Cuban dictator Fidel Castro that helped pave the way for the historic papal visit to the communist island a decade later. Over the years, he's visited nations wrecked by genocidal human rights abuses from the Balkans to Rwanda. Last December, President Clinton presented him with the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights. Your Eminence, welcome to the National Press Club. Rick, thank you very much. Uh, Rick and I were chatting before, and he said this is the first time he's doing what he did, and I said that's the first time I'm doing what I'm doing, and so we both hoped that we would do it well. If I can do it half as well as you did your job, I'll be very pleased. The, uh, the only thing I would like to say about uh, papal elections, I did, I did re recognize that for the first time people were praying to St. Chad. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, what that has to do with the whole, with the whole operation. Uh, I'm, I want to say I'm, I'm genuinely pleased and honored by your invitation. It is, uh, it's a great privilege to be with you. And, uh, and as someone who has watched C-SPAN for a long time uh, and has watched these, uh, these fascinating uh, uh, talks uh, after lunch, uh, I, I approach this with a certain amount of awe, uh, uh, not untinged with anxiety, 
because I, I know that uh, you have had some wonderful speakers and that they've said some wonderful things, some important things. And I, I hope that what I will say will be useful uh, as, we, as we move along. Uh, I, I want to talk about, about human rights. I, I guess it's one of the things that maybe I know something about, uh, although whenever I see a group of folks from the, uh, from the Fourth Estate, I, I appreciate that you know much more about it than I ever will. Uh, and so uh, it is with great humility that I come to talk to you about it. Uh, I want to do two things. Uh, I, I want to tell you some stories, uh, and then I, I want to give this uh, note about human rights in the context of the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II's uh, view on human rights, because it's a, it, it's a very beautiful and a very great philosophical uh, approach to it. And I think sometimes we when we hear the Holy Father speaking, as he often does, about human rights in many different parts of the world, we, we may forget that, uh, that this is always based on a, a great philosophical and, and theological basis and foundation. Uh, I guess I, uh, I, you have already heard all the things that I, I've, had, I've been doing in my life, uh, so I, I do come to this subject with a, with a, lot, of, uh, a lot of experience. Uh, the experience is maybe not as deep or profound as it ought to be, but it's been an experience which has touched the heart because I've had the, I've had the privilege of seeing uh, human rights violated. I have the privilege of, the, maybe not as a privilege, maybe it's a penalty, of seeing uh, people who are too poor to, uh, to find a way to live, uh, too poor to, to find a way to raise their children, uh, too sick to, uh, to find an opportunity to survive. Uh, and when you see these things and when you realize that, that they are caused so often by, by the failure uh, not, of, uh, not, of the, uh, not of the systems but of people as well as systems, uh, you know that, that there is something that, that the world is challenged to do, something that the world must do if we are going to make this new millennium a, a time of peace, a time of growth, a time of, a time of joy for all the people of the world. Uh, I want to start with a story. It's a story that happened, I guess, in the, in the fall of, of 98, 97, 98. It was around the time when uh, Kosovo was, uh, was about to, uh, to explode. Uh, the, the Serbian militia was in there, and the people were already fleeing into the hills. Uh, they, they, they knew that they were, they were going to have trouble. And there were uh, different skirmishes between the, the Kosovo uh, military uh, uh, militia uh, and the Serbian military and police. And, and uh, people were, were beginning to be killed and people were beginning to, to be very scared and moving up into the hills. That's always the, the problem that you meet in, in these countries. And I think you, you all are aware of it. When, whenever trouble comes, People want to get away. People look for safety. And they, they sometimes try to find it in the hills, in the forests, in, in the areas where they can escape to, uh, not realizing that the winter's coming, not realizing that the rainy season's coming, not realizing that, that the weather, which is agreeable to a certain extent today, may be terrible tomorrow. But they have no place to go. And so they go up into the hills where many of them will freeze to death. They go up into the hills where many children won't, won't be able to find food to to survive. They go up into the hills where, where they, will, they will meet other, <coughs> other dangers uh, as equally as, as dangerous, as difficult, as, as frightening as the dangers that they face uh, down uh, in the plain. So I was driving along. <coughs> I was on the way from Pristina, the capital, to Prizren. Prizren is, is one of the ancient cities of Kosovo where the, the Catholic bishop lives. And so I was going to see him and find out what, uh, how we could help, because I was on the Board of Catholic Relief Services at the time. We were driving a white van, and the fellow with me spoke both English and, uh, and uh, Albanian as, as well as, as Serb, so that he was, uh, he was a good guide to go with. And we were, we were driving along, and we'd be stopped at different checkpoints along the way, uh, because there had been difficulties in the area. Uh, and we we were about to turn a, a, a road, uh, turn around, uh, and 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 hit a, a new part of the road that was not exposed to us before. And as we turned, there was a uh, a horse-drawn cart with two young men, maybe 18, 20 years old, and the cart was piled up with what apparently was 
all their belongings, all the things that, that they had known that they had to take with them as they were fleeing into the hills, into the mountains. And they were going along, and as they saw us, they turned around, they saw us, they saw the car, the car and they jumped out without, without waiting for a moment and ran into the high hills, high bushes, high trees, and, and, and disappeared. And I turned to the driver, I said, what was that all about? He said, well, unfortunately, the van that we use is the same vans that the Serb police use. And these young men are afraid that they're going to be killed. They're afraid that they may be shot. They're afraid that they could be arrested and then disappear. I said, well, you stop and, and tell them that, that we're, not, we're not that. And he looked at me and smiled. He said, Archbishop, he said, that's exactly what they would expect the Serbs to do. That exactly what they would expect other people to do, to pretend that they weren't. And so we, we stopped for a moment and, and hoped somehow that we'd see them. And I got out, I was dressed like this, and so we thought maybe if they saw a, a priest they, they, would, they would come back. They never did. And as we drove off, I had that sinking feeling in my heart that here is real fear. Here is the fear that, that, that drives people to, to situations that no one should be driven to. His fear that, that makes it impossible for someone really to live a, a life that, that, that has value. I, I remember when I was a little kid, not that little, I guess, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt came up with that wonderful 1937 talk about the four freedoms. And uh, I guess they made such an impression on me then that I, that I, I never forgot them. That uh, he said, and I looked up the quote, in, in future days, which we will need to make secure. We look forward to a world founded upon four essential freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God as he chooses everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, and the fourth is freedom from fear. That was the fear that these young men were not free from. That was the fear that, that drove them into the, into the high bushes. That was the fear that, that changed their lives. I think that's where human rights begin. It, it begins with, the, with the, the need to look for freedom, the need to, to look to be what you need, what you want to be, what God has made you to be. The Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, uh, is a great philosopher. Uh, I, I've often thought that he, if he had not become Pope, he might have gone down in history as the, the major Catholic philosopher of the, of the, of the 20th century. Uh, in his first encyclical, uh, The Redeemer of Man, he, he situates this whole question of human rights and the whole question of, of his pontificate. It really was the blueprint of the, the, the 23 years that have already followed uh, his election as, as Holy Father. And, and in it, he situates the the value of the individual as the key to all society, the dignity of the human person. It is in the dignity of the human person that, that we find our rights, that we find our ability to, to be in the world as the actors in, in this world of ours. Uh, he has a, a wonderful, and if I may quote it for just a moment, a great paragraph in there, uh, very beautiful, very philosophical, and, and very moving. He says, each man in all the repeatable reality of what he is and what he does, of his intellect and will, his conscience and heart, each man in, is in his reality a person. And that person is a history of his life that is his own, and most important, a history of his soul that is his own. We are our history. We are our own personality. Man who, in keeping with the openness of his spirit within and also the many diverse needs of his body and his existence in time, writes this personal history through numerous bonds and contacts and situations and social structures which link him to other people, beginning from the first moment of his existence on earth from the, to the moment of his going home to God. This is man in the full truth of his existence, his personal being, his relationships, and the Holy Father keeps looking at this as, the, as, as what makes the value of man, what makes us to be very special people, what makes us to be different from the animals, different from anything else in the world, creatures that, that can create, creatures can, that can think, creatures that can dream, creatures that can laugh and smile and, and enjoy. 
And unfortunately, creatures that can fear and, and have anxiety and lose and weep and mourn and, and grieve. But it is in that, in that human person that we find all the wonder and all the beauty of, of, of our human existence. And it is from that that the, that the great thinkers have found the ability to project the rights that we have, the, the important notions of our freedom, of our liberty, of our progress, of our, of our peace. In the Second Vatican Council, which the Holy Father attended and in which he was a, a major figure, uh, in its documents, express the church's fundamental solicitude that life in the world should conform more to man's surpassing dignity in all its aspect so that this life might always become more human. I think that when I get involved in advocating for human rights, and I, I'm sure this is true of most of us, when we get involved in advocating for human rights, it is because we have that kind of concept of the human person. We, we, we have that kind of awe that, that God has made us so wonderful, that God has given us such a tremendous opportunity for vision, for, for love, for, for adventure, for, for all the great, beautiful, joyful things of life. And it is because God has given it to this that, that, that each individual must enjoy that. Each, each individual should have that kind of ability. Each individual should be able to live in that way and love in that way. Each individual should be able to enjoy his humanity or her humanity in the, the best and most probable and wonderful way. For us Christians, it is a dignity that is enhanced, of course, by by the redemption, by the fact that God so loved the world that he sent his only son to be like us so that all of us might become in every way filled with the, with, with the wonder of, of his love. But for everyone, not just Christians, there is a sense of humanity. It's in all the books, all the holy books. It's in the Koran, it's in, in the Bible, it's in the, in the writings of the Eastern religions. Uh, this great sense of the wonder of the human being, this great sense of what man can do. And yet, in today's world, this man, this woman, this human person can be so limited, can be so denied, can be so hurt by the actions of others, by the actions of a state, by the actions of a system that can be oppressive and downtrodden. And this is the context in which I, I have found the, my, my advocacy or, or my concerns about human rights. I think to a certain extent, tell you another story, it, it started in the Sudan uh, years ago. I was on the board of Catholic Relief Services and I was, uh, was going to Sudan to, to look at the refugee problem there. And uh, one of the, the missionaries said, you have not understood it until you have been to Omdurman. Omdurman, of course, is, the, is that city on the other side of Khartoum, the other side of the, of the Nile, on, on the, the west side, going toward the desert. And it, is, it was there that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people would be fleeing both from the Sahel, from that, the ongoing spread of the desert, the, the ongoing spread of the dryness, the, the ongoing lack of, of water. Uh, th they would come from there, and also, we now know, that they were fleeing also from, from a government that was not, not able to defend itself from the charges of genocide, from a government that had no use for so many of its own citizens. And so they were fleeing from there. They were fleeing from those there, from the Nubian mountains, from, from, that, from that section. And when we coursed to the other side, we began to see right by, the, right by the river there were fine homes, and then you got back and the homes were a little less, less, less uh, conspicuous. And then as you got a couple of miles from the river, there were tents. And as you got beyond that, there were shambles and shacks. And I met a family there, another thing I'll never forget. I met a family, and I, I said to the, to the priest who, who spoke Arabic, tell me about your life here. And they said, it has been a great disaster. We came with our family. We were not poor. We had vegetables. 
but we knew that the garden was going to be destroyed. So we brought the vegetables. We brought a goat. Some people in our group brought a camel. They were, they were wealthy. And when we came, we only got within three miles of the river, and we could not go beyond that to get water. They would not let us. They would sell us water. The government would sell them water. And all our money was used up in a month. All our furniture was used up in another month. All our goods was used up in another one. The animals were killed or sold in another one. And then the horror. And then you sell your children. You sell one child so the others can live. I will never forget that. There is slavery in our world today. A and it is slavery caused by all kinds of things, by corrupt government officials in some countries, by, by, by a, a, an impossible economic situation in another country, by an unwillingness to, to open up the opportunities of life to, to different groups and different tribes and different nations. That is what happens to human rights. That is what happens when, when people do not see the tremendous value of the human person and when people do not find a way to live in such a, a manner that they live for others and not just for themselves. I have many stories, but I will not be burden you with them now. I just want to say uh, maybe three things in, in in closing, and I'll be open to questions, of course. Uh, the one is, one of the things that's happening in our society, and you know this so well because the, the, the advances that we've made would not have been possible without the press, without the media. We would never have made the progress in beginning to work on the terrible debt of the third world countries. This is one of the slaveries of our, of our time. I use the word not in the ex exact context, but, but in a certain sense, this is true. There are countries which have overwhelming debts. You know this so well. These are debts which were not initiated by the people who were paying them off. So often they were debts initiated by, by a dictator or by, uh, by some combine that wanted to have a military adventure or that wanted to build a, an extraordinary uh, new uh, dam or, or new uh, social uh, public service project. And it didn't, it didn't work. There was so much corruption, the money left the country. And those who had paid, those who had borrowed, as a country, saw nothing of the money that came in. And now they are faced with it. And now they must pay it. And they must pay it by paying exorbitant interest. The exorbitant interest which in, is often, in a few years, equal to the whole amount of the debt itself. So that people have paid off these debts time and time again without ever touching the principal because they're paying off the interest all the time on a debt that did them no good, on money that they had never seen. And what happens so often is that in the necessity of paying off the interest, money that should be spent for education is not there. Money that should be spent for health is not there. Money that should have been spent for, 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 for youngsters to give them a chance in the world is not there. Money that should be spent to take care of old people in, the, in the, the twilight of their lives is not there. That social services are not present because the money which is there and should be used for that must go to pay the debt. I'm so grateful to the Congress of the United States and to our government that, that in the past years we've been able to, to make something of a beginning on helping the third world countries pay their debt. I pray that will always continue. I pray that every American government will see the need to take, to take a leadership role in this, as I pray that every nation in the world will find its own responsibility to give that dignity back to those who, who need it. Let me go to the last point. 
We talked about slavery in the world. There's still slavery in the world. It, it goes by different names sometimes. One of the most terrible things that's happening that is for me a great denial of human rights is the traffic in human beings which is going on in so many parts of the world. I, I know that it's going on in the Balkans. I know that, that people are being transshipped from, from the Near East, from, from the Middle East, from, from Central Asia, from the Balkans and through the Balkans and there into the Western world and to other countries and in other more prosperous countries. These are women who, because they are poor or because they are uneducated or because they find that their family structure is not sufficient to, to hold them together, women who who are enticed by someone who says, oh, you, you're so beautiful, you could be a model, or you're so smart, you could be a teacher, or you're so industrious, you could be a maid. Come, I will, I will pay your way, and you'll pay me back. And so often they end up in prostitution. So often they end up in, 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 in terrible labor conditions. There are women and children from many countries of the world from all the races of the world today being taken from their homes and the family drinks one less mouth to feed, one, one of our daughters doing well, and they can never come back. This is going on in our world today. Thank goodness there is a, 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 an organization in the Southeast Central Euro Europe now which is starting to to galvanize the nations and the, and the religious groups of the world to see that this is a slavery of our time. This is one of the things that we can work against. This is one of the things that we can stop. This is one of the things that we, that we have to do. All this comes from this one world of ours where national borders seem to fail or fall and we, we face, we face a, a one world. They say it is the height of, uh, of, uh, of pride, perhaps, to quote yourself, but I'm going to ask permission to do it. Uh, at this consistory that uh, Rick was nice enough to mention, where all the cardinals were gathered, uh, each of us had a chance to, to make an intervention. I'd like to read you a part of what I said because I was talking about globalization, I was talking about the poor, and I was talking about human rights. In the new moment of developing globalization in our society, the twofold task of fidelity reaches its greatest importance. Globalization can be described in so many ways. On the description dis depends the assessment of its worth or its danger. If globalization basically means making more available the scientific, the medical, the economic, and the sociological advances of our society to every nation and every group and every city and every individual, then it's a blessing and something which should be promoted and heralded. The question will always be, however, that globalization may in the long run be bringing all these advances and all the material concomitants that go with them only to a minority, only to the wealthy, only to those nations which are amply developed, only to those who can buy and use these new advances. If that is the definition, then globalization will drastically increase the chasm between the rich and the poor. It will divide the world even as it has never been divided before, and those who are poor will multiply, and those who are unable to participate will increase in number to a frightening degree. We know that charity begins at home, we know that doesn't end there. We must find the way to accomplish globalization with a conscience, to build the future on the dignity of each human person, to find in that foundation the end of the attacks against human rights, and indeed to find and to live for the hope of the world. Thank you very much.
thanks very much. We have a lot of questions already, so why don't we get started? Uh, we can start with some questions on uh, human rights and religious freedom. Uh, first one, uh, you've recently returned from a trip to the Middle East with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Can you share the findings of your mission, particularly on the problems faced by Christians in the region? Of course, it, it, those problems faced by every religious group depends on, on what the religious group is and on where you are. Uh, there is there's no, no doubt that uh, for, uh, for many countries uh, of the Middle East, some religious groups are, are new, and some re when something is something is new, you look at it with a certain, uh, certain wonder, maybe even a certain anxiety. Uh, I, I think some of the uh, of the, the the very fervent and, and enthusiastic evangelical churches who have come into the Middle East, as they have to some areas of uh, of, of Eastern Europe, uh, uh, have have come in and have found many problems because the people were not were not ready for for that kind of of, of enthusiastic Christianity. I think that will change as people get more used to, to what they are seeing. Uh, I think there are, there are some areas where uh, Christians are, uh, do not have the right, we all know that, to, uh, to offer public worship. Uh, they, they are allowed, uh, according to the, uh, the constitutions of these countries, to, to have private uh, religious services. The difficulty, of course, is what is the difference between public and private? Uh, is it a private religious service if you have it in someone's home and you sing and people hear the singing? Some say no, if people hear the singing it's not private, it's public and therefore you can't have that. Is it, uh, is it a private religious service if you, uh, if you gather uh, uh, around a, uh, uh, in a neighbor's house and, uh, and there are many cars parked around and they, that becomes a nuisance? And, People say, why are the cars parked there? And they find religious service going on. They say, no, that's no longer private, it's public. So it, in, in so many of these countries, it, it, the difficulty is to find what they mean by public and what they mean by private. And then also, uh, I think, uh, there is a tremendous tendency in so many countries of the world to, to decide that they're going to use religion as, uh, as a, a, a a cover for nationalism, to use religion as a cover for, uh, for, for some point of view that, that one group wants rather than another. Uh, we've seen fundamentalists of, of every major religion come a and, and become sometimes very harsh and, and very difficult because they are using the religion to foster maybe a militant, uh, a militant ethnic uh, position or a, a militant desire to, uh, to, to get more authority, more power over the other, uh, the other uh, co-religionists that they may have. Uh, it's hard to give a, a, a direct answer. We, we had a, we, we had a, a very uh, interesting uh, journey in, uh, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Israel, in the occupied territories, uh, and there are, there are problems everywhere in the world. Uh, and there are problems there. There are problems in, 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 in so many countries. Uh, it, it seems to me that, that what we have to do is keep talking. That what we have to do is keep dialoguing. What we have to do is, is, not, uh, is put our, our guns, our swords, our scimitars, whatever, on the table and then talk heart to heart. Uh, I think if, if we go back to what the Holy Father is talking about, the dignity of the human person, if we can present that as, uh, as, the, as the bridge, then we might be able to make progress. You spoke movingly of the slavery in Sudan. What do you think the United States should do, and what should the church and churches do? Well, I, we were all pleased that the, uh, President Bush has, is about to name a, a mediator, a, a representative there in, in Sudan who will have uh, ability to talk at, at the highest levels. Uh, I think that we in the United States have to use our, uh, our influence. I, if I may digress for a moment, American foreign policy in the old days uh, did not get at all involved in, in religion or in, in human rights in the other countries. This was considered to be something that was uh, that was totally uh, an internal affair of the of the nation. 
I think that's changing. I think the fact that the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights has been signed by nations makes it possible for us to say to a nation, you signed that. You made a commitment to human rights. And therefore, we can ask you about it. And we can examine what you're doing to fulfill that commitment. The world community has the right to know once you have agreed to be part of, of that. And I think this is true of Sudan. I think we must be able to, to have dialogue with Sudan. We must, of course, we, we have seen the, we, we know that slavery exists in Sudan. We know that, that, uh, that they really uh, cannot defend themselves against a, against a, a, the charge of, of, of genocidal attacks. Uh, we know that, uh, that so many things happened. There, a, a couple of years ago, there was a Catholic school in, in, uh, in, the, in the southern part of Sudan, and a plane came over, and the, it was noontime. The kids were out in, in, the, in the plaza uh, all having lunch, and the plane came and bombed the plaza. And, and when, I guess, our ambassador or somebody said to them, that was a terrible thing. You, you have to be more careful about where you're doing that. The answer came back horribly. This is where we wanted it to go. And so I, I think the situation in Sudan is the Sudanese people are wonderful. I, I've, I visited there. I got to know them. I, I, I've seen their, 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 their hard working, both the north and the south. Uh, but they've had a government that has been determined to, uh, to be uh, aggressive and to be in total control. The fact of oil in the Sudan now has, may, has just complicated it tremendously because there are companies, that are Ameri not American countries, I hope, but there are companies in the West that are making a great deal of money off the oil in Sudan, and because of that, they are supporting the military regimes. So we have to, that's something we must look at and something we must try to, to correct. Following up your mention of um, corporate interests and uh, globalization before, a questioner asks, uh, do you consider a corporate, uh, corporate power a threat to the individual and our common humanity? It can be. It can be. Uh, on the other hand, it can be a, a remarkably useful instrument in raising up the, the, whole, the whole human race. Uh, it, it, there, there, is a, there is a way in which a, a, a rising tide uh, lifts, all, lifts all ships. There is a way. And, and corporate power used properly, corporate power used with a, with a humanitarian understanding can be of enormous influence. And, and there are corporations that are doing that today. There are also corporations that are not doing that today, where the profit motive is the, is, is the, major, uh, the, the major focus. Uh, I, I think that's, that's another thing that we have to be, be insisting on. We have to be striving to make sure that, that our corporations are playing a positive role in the, in the life of the world. They can be. Many of them are. And we have to get them all to be. Um, what are your views on China and religious freedom in China now, two years after your visit? Uh, who was it that said China is an enigma inside a puzzle, inside another enigma? Uh, I, I think whoever said that was probably true. Uh, I, I had, and, and those who went with me, had a wonderful visit with Jiang Zemin. Uh, I found him to be a thoughtful, wise, intelligent man. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that, that he would like to make changes. But I believe that they are concerned that they will lose control. Uh, I think that was the, the difficulty with the, with the Falun Gong. They, w they saw this, this huge group of maybe millions and millions of people, and, and they, they felt that this, this could be a threat to the stability of China. Uh, I think they, they feel that with regard to, to many religious, uh, religious groups. Uh, we assured him uh, that, uh, that religious people are always the best citizens because they, they have the best, the, the best desire to, to make everything work out right, that they, that they, will, that they will be productive, that they will, that they will build up the country. Uh, I, uh, I have been disappointed, uh, obviously, I guess all of us have, in, in the in, in some of the things that have happened in, in China in the last, uh, in the last two years. Uh, I, I hope it's temporary. I, I hope that, 
that when the, the this terrific concern that, that the Chinese government seems to have for Falun Gong, when, when, when that recedes and they see that, that they have not lost the, the authority over the nation, that they will become more reasonable and more open again to giving chances for, for people who have faith in, in God to become part of a new China that will work together for the, for the good of the world. There are a couple of personal questions. Uh, one uh, asks, how did your early year years in the Bronx, especially after your father died, affect your priorities in the ministry? It's great to grow up poor. It's the best thing for you. I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> but, but, you know, I was a kid of the Depression. And uh, I always tell the story, a quick story. When uh, my mother, my father died, my mother had to go to work in a, uh, in a factory uh, uh, that made automobile parts in, in the Bronx. And uh, we actually, I, I lived in Manhattan. She worked in the Bronx. Uh, and we, we used to go, my grandmother would take me, I was maybe five years old, my grandmother would take me to uh, the trolley car stop where she'd come over the bridge from the Bronx. And uh, I was not very, very bright. That has stayed with me all these years. I, I thought that you got overtime when you left the, the place the, the, of work the last day, that they said, uh, Margaret, you have overtime. And she said, thank you. Uh, I didn't realize that overtime was something you had, you worked for during, during the week, that you had overtime on Mondays. And, and so when she'd get off the trolley, because if, he, if she had overtime, I'd get a nickel. I'd get a nickel, and I could buy a toy. And if she didn't get overtime, then I couldn't get the nickel. Uh, and I remember getting off. I remember first I say, "Mom, did you have overtime? <laughs> did you get overtime?" I, I, th I thought you got it at the end of the day. Said, Here you got Mrs. McCarrick, You got overtime. Uh, but you know, we, we you learn to do without, and and you and you learn. I hope you you learn to have understanding of people who do without. We were not very poor. We you know, my mom had a job and there was food on the table and. Uh, and we, we were able to have a place to live. And I went to Catholic school where you didn't have to pay, in the days when you didn't have to pay tuition, which I wish some of you would get on board to strive to get vouchers or something like that so that the millions of families that would like to do it today aren't able to. But, but you, 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 you knew not to waste things. And I think that that was very important for me. My secretary will tell you it's still too important for me. <laughs> but life is like that. You speak almost as many languages as the Pope. When you speak to the Pope, what language do you speak, and what does he speak? <laughs> uh, he's very good. He usually, if he sees an English speaker, he will usually speak English. Sometimes, if it's like toward the end of the day and everybody's tired, then we'll all speak in Italian, uh, unless we speak Polish. I can understand a little Polish, but when he goes fast, then I say, and then he laughs and he goes into Italian or something else. But, uh, but uh, he, uh, we usually do uh, speak English, and uh, his English is very, is, is very sharp. Um, do you see an anti-Catholic bias in the general news media, and do you feel that leaders of the church in the country combat such treatment when it does occur in a sufficiently aggressive fashion? Well, uh, who was it that said that anti-Catholicism is the only res uh, respectable bias that's left? <laughs> and I, I, I think there's something in that. You know, you, uh, the newspapers would be very, very loath to do anything that could be considered anti almost any other religious group or race or, or ethnic group but they, they don't seem to have the same concern about the Catholics. It, to some extent, I think that's a tribute to the church because they, that we stand for something. We stand for something that's very clear, and please God, we always will. Uh, we stand for, for, ri for human rights. We stand for, for, for peace. We stand for responsibility. Well, we st you know what we stand for. But uh, I think that it, there is something of it it, it raises its ugly head once in a while. It's, it's not as grave as it used to be. But when it's there, it, it, it's so upsetting 
because it uh, because it we are singled out. I think when it does happen, doesn't happen that often. Uh, do we respond aggressively? Well, you know, I, I think we try to respond responsibly, uh, and uh, that's that's the most important thing. You, you try to respond in a way that will make your response uh, able to correct the difficulty, and uh, and leave everybody on the same page. To tear up the page does you no good because uh, you'll never get anybody to write on it again. So I think that uh, I, I think that in 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 many ways, uh, when the hierarchy responds, uh, we respond uh, in the correct way. Uh, I don't think you you try to bang anybody over the head, even if they bang you over the head, because that's not what we teach. Uh, I think we have to respond honestly in a gentlemanly manner, truthfully, and firmly. And then we move on. We have, a, we have a large number of issue questions. I'll try to get to a couple of them quickly here. Um, do you think the church will ever institute a compulsory retirement age for the papacy or allow priests to wed? Well, I, I don't think I'm the one to, to get that question or to answer it. Uh, as, as you know, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Eastern churches, uh, of which are part of the Roman Catholic Church, or part of the, part of the Catholic Church, uh, priests uh, are allowed to wed in, in m many parts of the world. Uh, we in the, in the Latin Church and the Western Church uh, have had this, this, this great gift of celibacy. It, it's, I say it's a gift. It is, uh, it is a sacrifice. It is a, uh, it is an opportunity to for, for for deepest service, an opportunity for deepest love, an opportunity for placing a, a human being totally in the hands of the Lord, and in the hands of the Church. Uh, I think that's a very beautiful thing. It's not made for everybody. Certainly not meant for everybody, and. Uh, but I think for those who, who, can, who can take it, who can live it, it's a, it's a great blessing. Uh, with regard to the other question, uh, the, uh, the, the, the law of the church uh, it depends on the lawgiver, and the lawgiver is the Holy Father. The Holy Father can make whatever decisions he, he desires to make for the good of the church, and uh, I, I, I have great confidence that... Uh, that uh, the Lord will guide the Holy Father and will, will keep him uh, strong and, uh, and, and viable and visible. And uh, may I tell you one story? I know you, you want to get to it, but just one quick story. Uh, they're talking about the, the Holy Father getting, getting very tired. The Holy Father's frail. But uh, during this consistory, uh, there were 155 of us, and everybody gets up to talk. Well, one day in the morning, they said, only seven people left. We were so happy. It's all oh, good. We're going to get out early. And then when we came back in the afternoon, they said, well, I shouldn't have told you that there were only seven because now there are 40. So we said, oh, it's going to be terrible. So we did the whole afternoon, and uh, around, around 8 o'clock at night, we're all, you know, bleary-eyed and uh, some dozing on the side. Not myself. <laughs> I, I had slept the day before. But... Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, they finally, the, the cardinal, whoever was the cardinal president, said, "It's the end of the, uh, the session now. We, we've really gone long enough. It's almost eight o'clock." And we all said, "Oh, thank God!" And everybody got up. Everybody was looking sort of really totally out of it. And uh, we all stood up. We looked, and the Holy Father's sitting there, and he looks at us, and he gets up, and he takes the microphone. He looks at us, and he says, "I need to tell you, the next session will be at midnight." <laughs> And it was just a, a great sign of the fact that he's still with it, he still has a great sense of humor, and he still, he still can read the minds of the people around him. Uh, the governor of Oklahoma is going to be speaking at the press club in a few days about the aftermath of the Timothy McVeigh affair. I was wondering if you would uh, talk to us a little bit about your views on capital punishment. Well, I, I believe that, that God is the master of life. And uh, we believe, we who are in the Catholic community, believe that, that life does not, that we don't have control over life, that life is, is God, is God's gift to us. 
It's God's gift to us from the moment of conception. That's why we are opposed to abortion. From the moment of conception to the moment God calls us home, the moment we close our eyes in the final sleep. That's why we're opposed to euthanasia and assisted suicide. And everywhere in between. You know, if we want to be consistent, you know, the con this consistent defense of life. Now, it would, sure, you, you can say the life of the baby in the womb is innocent, the life of the older person is innocent, the life of a, uh, of a murderer is, is not innocent. Uh, and yet, uh, when all is said and done, God is still, you know, the, God is still the Lord of life, and he's the master of all those things. So I think to, that's where we have to be. We are opposed to capital punishment. We're opposed to anyone except God who gives life, taking life away. There's got to be other ways to do it. There's got to be other ways to protect society against murders and things like that. Uh, we don't think that this is, the, this is the way to do it. Before asking you the final question, I'd like to present you a certificate of appreciation from the Press Club. Thank you. Thank you. And the famous National <laughs> Press Club mug. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> now, our, our final question comes from someone in the audience who asks, after 12 years of Catholic school, I'm still confused on a major point, but maybe that's because I never had the chance to ask a cardinal. In 25 words or less, can you explain the relationship between the three main figures of the Holy Trinity? <laughs> Very, <laughs> without any trouble at all, it's, 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 it's love. It's the love that binds them together and that same love they have for us. Thanks very much. Okay. I'd like... I'd like to thank you for coming today. I'd also like to thank National Press Club staff members Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, Melanie abdo Dermott, and Howard Rothman, and Speakers Committee member Al Isley of the Hill for organizing today's lunch. And also thanks to the NPC's library research staff for their research. We're adjourned. Visible and most diverse Catholic communities Cardinal McCarrick has focused on the spiritual, moral, and material welfare of the approximately half million Catholics in the District of Columbia and surrounding areas. Though a native of New York City, he is uh, no stranger to Washington. After being ordained in 1958, he went on to earn a second master's degree and a PhD at the Catholic University of America. His, assign his first assignment was assistant chaplain of Catholic University and later dean of students and director of development. After serving as president of the Catholic University of Puerto Rico, he returned to New York to serve as associate secretary for education of the archdiocese and then as secretary to Cardinal Cook. He was named auxiliary bishop of New York in 1977 with responsibility for Harlem. He crossed the Hudson River in 1986 to become the first ever bishop of Metuchen in New Jersey when that diocese was established in 1981. Uh, 19, uh, sorry, in 1981. In 1986, he was named Archbishop of Newark, the seventh largest diocese in the country. Uh, the mayor of Newark, Sharp James, uh, recently said that Cardinal McCarrick's commitment to Newark, quote, was a major force in the city's recent revival. Cardinal McCarrick's involvement in international humanitarian efforts began when he was elected by the National Conference of Catholic Bishops to head its Committee on Migration in 1986. In 1992, he was named to head the Committee for Aid to the Church in Central and Eastern Europe, and four years later was elected chair of the Committee of, on International Policy. Earlier this year, while hosting President and Mrs. Bush at dinner, he lobbied the President. Always a good idea when you have him close by. <laughs> uh, about one of his pet causes, the need for more assistance in El Salvador uh, following the devastating earthquake there on January 13th. Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Rick Dunham, White House correspondent for Business Week magazine and chairman of the board of the National Press Club. Uh, I'd like to welcome our members and the guests in the audience today, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN 
or listening on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live, and it's available through the National Press Club, the website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons also are carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members also may access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase the transcripts and audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I'd like to remind our members of some upcoming National Press Club luncheons. Monday, June 18th, Terrence Jones, the President and CEO of the Wolf Trap Foundation for the Performing Arts, will discuss commissioning new performance in today's politically and economically challenging environment. On Friday, June 22nd, Frank Keating, the Governor of Oklahoma, will be our guest at the Press Club. On Monday, June 25th, George Mitchell, the former Senate Majority Leader and the Chairman of the Sharm El Sheikh Fact-Finding Commission, which recently issued a report on the current Israeli-Palestinian crisis, will speak on the Middle East. And coming up this summer, we have some uh, big names on the agenda, including Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor for the President, on July 12th, and Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton will be making her debut as a luncheon speaker on July 19th. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided on your tables and pass them up to me. I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce the head table and ask the guests at the head table to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right, John Hurley of the McClendon News Service. Larry Witham covers religion for the Washington Times. Caitlin Hendel, the co-leader of the economy team at Bloomberg News and a former colleague of mine at the Dallas Times Herald. Chris Newcomet of McGraw-Hill. Jan Duplain, the president and CEO of Duplain Enterprises, who represents the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington. Father Drew Christensen, Senior Fellow at the Woodstock Theological Center and Counselor on International Affairs at the U.S. Catholic Conference. John Cosgrove, Distinguished Former President of the National Press Club and a Communications Consultant. Skipping our speaker for a moment, we have Martin Tolchin, the Publisher and Editor of The Hill. Melissa Charbonneau, White House Correspondent for CBN. Shelvia Dancy, National Correspondent for Religion News Service. Frank Smythe, Washington Representative of the Committee to, uh, to Protect Journalists. And Mamora Onaki, American Bureau Chief for the Chunichi Tokyo Shimbun. Now, the first time a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church spoke at the National Press Club was 1936. The speaker was Eugene Cardinal Pacelli, Vatican Secretary of State. It so happened that Cardinal Pacelli soon thereafter became the Pope, Pope Pius XII. Now, I'm not saying that today's speaker, <laughs> Theod Theodore Cardinal McCarrick, will be the next Pope, but uh, likely he'll be there picking the next Pope. In February, just seven weeks after he was installed as Archbishop of Washington, Cardinal McCarrick was named one of 44 cardinals by Pope John Paul II. He's one of 134 cardinals eligible to vote to elect the next pope. I trust he'll benefit from some of the experiences of the last American presidential election, and um, in case he's called upon to um, settle a dispute in the, um, in, in the papal election. After all, the College of Cardinals is um, governed by a different kind of Supreme Court. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, seriously though, uh, Cardinal McCarrick is a uh, leading Catholic voice on um, social justice, human rights, and religious freedom, both in the United States and around the world. As the New York Times wrote in March, quote, trying to improve the world step by halting step is the vocation of this much traveled cleric who insists that his focus on human rights overseas and against workshops, uh, sweatshops, and homelessness in the United States are as much a part of his job as saying mass. Cardinal McCarrick, a self-confessed workaholic who is still spry and tireless at age 70, was one of 155 cardinals who met with the Pope 
for four days in, in Rome last month to discuss the future of the Roman Catholic Church. To show how times change, uh, even in the hallowed halls of, of the Vatican, it was reported that a cell phone rang out during the, uh, a silent moment of uh, contemplation on the first day of this. And yes, uh, these things don't only happen in the White House at photo ops. Uh, but reliable sources tell me the phone did not belong to our speaker today. <laughs> As head of one of the nation's most, with more than 100,000 El Salvador or Salvadoran parishioners, he said he felt as if the disaster had affected his own family. Cardinal McCarrick, who speaks five languages fluently, not including New Yorkese and uh, Joyzy talk, um, and understands two more, has visited many nations as a member of the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Religious Freedom Abroad and of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Already this year, he's visited El Salvador, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Italy, and the Caribbean. He's undertaken a number of sensitive political missions for the church, including a January 1998 visit to China to discuss religi religious freedom in that country, and a landmark 1988 meeting with Cuban dictator Fidel Castro that helped pave the way for the historic papal visit to the communist island a decade later. Over the years, he's visited nations wrecked by genocidal human rights abuses from the Balkans to Rwanda. Last December, President Clinton presented him with the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights. Your Eminence, welcome to the National Press Club. Rick, thank you very much. Uh, Rick and I were chatting before, and he said this is the first time he's doing what he did. And I said, that's the first time I'm doing what I'm doing. And so we both hoped that we would do it well. If I can do it half as well as you did your job, I'll be very pleased. The, uh, the only thing I would like to say about uh, papal elections, I did, I did re recognize that for the first time, people were praying to St. Chad. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what, what that has to do with the whole, with the whole operation. Uh, I'm, I want to say I'm, I'm genuinely pleased and honored by